That is the question that we're endeavoring to answer personally. It's the only question that really, really matters. All other questions really won't matter. Um, everyone decide where they're going to go to dinner tonight? It doesn't matter. <clears throat> what are you doing tomorrow? I want to do the rock so bad. It doesn't matter. Okay, but I won't. <clears throat> and the only question that matters is who is Jesus? That's the only question that matters. And, and, and 500 years from now or 1,000 years from now, you're not going to be thinking about whether you went to Cracker Barrel tonight. You're going to be thinking about what do I do with Jesus? And that's the most important question. We need to answer that question. We've been, uh, we've been trying to answer that question by finding out who Jesus really is. Uh, for about eight, nine months now, we've been studying through the Gospel of Luke because we wanted to understand what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, not necessarily what your mom thinks. Or even what I think. What I think really doesn't matter unless it lines up with what God thinks. That was a good place for an amen. amen. And so <clears throat> that's what we're going to do tonight. We've kind of taken some detours uh, through our holiday season here. Easter, Good Friday, all that. Sometimes I feel like we need to go somewhere else. And so I'm just trying to be obedient to, to the Holy Spirit and preach uh, what he wants me to preach. And you know, tonight we're going to jump back into uh, the Gospel of Luke. And so... Uh, I would suggest to you that it's very, very important that you get your hands on a copy of God's Word. And they're all over the place here in the church. Don't just listen to me. You'll get bored with me after a time, no matter how many jokes I tell, unless you're watching, looking at God's Word, okay? And so get a copy of that. Uh, they're all over the church. They're in the pews in front of you, and they're on the tables, and, and you can go ahead and grab one, and you can steal it if you want. No one's going to yell at you. You got permission. So go ahead and get a copy of God's Word and turn to Luke chapter 10. And we're going to find out a little bit more about, about Jesus and what he taught, what he says, and so we could kind of line up our life with it. You know, understanding truth, I shared this with the folks uh, at the stadium on Good Friday, understanding the truth about who God is is very, very important because it helps us to worship God accurately and, and passionately, and we need to worship God passionately. And, uh, and to that end, I, I stand before you every single week, and I try to pass on to you some truth, and, and, and sometimes... Um, You know, I, I, get, I get up here and I start preaching and, and, and trying to give you some. You can get a little riled up, right? It's cool to get riled up in church a little bit, get you fired up, get you out of your, get you out of your seat a little bit, maybe shout a little bit in church. I like that right there. Yeah, that's right, right? Get a little fired up about Jesus. That's cool. And uh, I like that. Um, but tonight, I think uh, having prepared for the week, I think tonight is, a, is, is uh, I might get a little bit fired up. Is that okay? Are you a little fired up? On a, just on occasion. I won't go crazy on you. But, 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 but I think tonight, having prepared, I think that I'm going to do a, just a, maybe a little bit more um, teaching of truth rather than, you know, getting at it. I might get at it a little bit, you know, if I feel so inclined. But, but I'm not going to go crazy on you. And... Uh, So today what I want to do is I, I want to I dismantle some, some lies that kind of plague the church and, and, and therefore they reduce our ability to worship God as he desires, you know? Um, what I mean by that is, is, is like Jesus tells us in John chapter 4, I think it's in verse 24, he says that, that God, like, like that God says this, that you must, look at someone and say must. It's not an option, is it? How much option is in must? Hold it up. None. Okay. You must worship God in spirit and in truth. That's what he's looking for. His eyes are going back and forth across this congregation right now. Can you feel him? And he's looking for those who, whose hearts are completely his, who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit as in small s. Not as in within Holy Spirit. You can't worship him if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. But he's saying small s. Worship him with your life. That's how that translates. Worship him with your feelings. Worship him with your emotions. Worship him with your tears. Worship him with your hands. Worship him with your mouth. Worship him with your eyes. Get, get fired up. Give, your, give yourself as a living sacrifice unto God. Give him everything. That, if you're breathing, give him your breath. We sang that song. It's your breath in our lungs. Come on. We pour out our praise. 
We pour out our praise. It's your praise. Come on now. Like it's his. Come on. Wait, I feel like I'm at the old age home. Come on now. What's up with that? Candy, come on. You, they, need, they need some leading, man. <clears throat> he wants us to... to, to if, next month. Um, <clears throat> I think you should take a month off. It's a great idea. That's a great idea. So, so, but he wants us to worship him in, in spirit, like with your life. Like everything that you are, you should be giving it up as a, as a, as a sign of worship, as an act of worship to him. And then in truth, right? Because I don't, look, we, get, we could get out here and I could say, hey, sing to, to, to this guitar over here. And we could sing, it's, it's Alvarez's breath in our lungs. So we pour out our prayer to a guitar. That would not be truth. So we have to worship him with all that we are, but it has to be the right God. And listen, the right way. You can make up whatever you want. We can worship the spaghetti monster, can we? That's not worshiping in truth. We worship the truth. We need to know what the truth is. And so Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42 is where we're going to find some truth tonight. You ready? Yes. All right. It's a very familiar story. If you spend any time in the Bible at all, you're going to go, oh, yeah, I know that. But listen up, though, because you might just learn something new. <clears throat> this section of Scripture is going to, going to lead us to, to another place at the very end of the message. But, but we're going to pick this thing apart. We're going to examine it kind of close. It'll be our main thing. So this is the story of Martha and Mary. Anyone ever heard of them? Yes. I don't know why I always say Mary and Martha. But it's Martha and Mary. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, I love that because Jesus knew he had a job to do, and, and, and God, God the Father sent him to do some work, to finish some work. That's, so what, nothing was stopping him from going to Jerusalem to save you. Uh, while he was doing that, he came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Now, I don't know if this is just me, but and it's just uh, conjecture, so I don't know that it's really biblical, but I would say that uh, Martha was probably the older sister. Um, she's the one who welcomed Jesus, and if she invites Jesus in, he's got some buddies with him, so they would come in too. And, and it says into her home. Now, that might just mean that it's hers and others, but I would, I would, I would guess here, just my own thing, again, not, not the Bible, just me, I think that she is the owner. Um, and her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. Uh, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, I love this, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. <clears throat> Let me ask you guys a question. I'm talking about dismantling some lies. And if we don't have the truth, we, don't, we can't worship Jesus well. Are there certain things that, that God likes above other things? In, in particular, are there certain ways that we could, different styles of worship or different ways that we could worship that God would favor above other things? When, you, when, you, when I ask you that question, if you're, if you're in the Bible at all, you, maybe some verses kind of sprout up. And, and when I was thinking about this, is that is there certain ways of worship that are, are better than others? Because you worship one way and you worship another way and says, God like that, I mean, I, I don't know, it kinda, it's kind of weird, but what popped into my mind were the couple of verses, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, what does that include? Everything. Everything. So no matter what you do, do it all to the glory of God. So, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna, um, if you're gonna paint a house, what should you do it? You should do it unto the Lord. Like, give them your best painting, right? If, if you're going to babysit someone, do the best job you can because Jesus is watching. You want to make him happy. Do it unto the Lord. Everything, right? 
And then how about this one? 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. So every, everything that you, every act of worship, everything that you do unto the Lord would absolutely have value and it would be good. Would you agree? But there's this issue, there's a struggle, there's a tension as to, well, what's the best thing? Because there's a lot of things that you could do. And I would say that everything that you do unto the Lord is good and has value, but some things are of greater good. And, and that might rub you wrong, but I don't want to just say it without supporting it with, with the scriptures. And so that's what we're endeavoring to do here tonight. I, I would say that some of you might be surprised when I tell you that in this sense, God grades on a curve, if you will. There's kind of like a good and gooder and gooderer and gooderist, if you will, right? I'm just messing with you, but, 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 but listen here. In verse 40, it says that Martha was distracted. <clears throat> That's kind of a weak translation. What happens is, 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 is she understands who Jesus is. She understands the importance of who he is, and this dude's coming to my house. The, the, the long-awaited Messiah has, is, is, is making his way to my house. And so if, if, if Jesus was coming to your house, would you cook him a nice dinner? Yeah. Absolutely, right? She understood who he was and, and what he stood for and how important he was and how valuable he was and how incredible that this opportunity was that he would come to her house. And so she cooks him a nice dinner. That's understandable. That's good. But it says that she was distracted. You know, the King James uses the word cumbered. And the word cumbered is only used one time in all of Scripture. And yes, it does mean distracted, but it also means to drag all around. Think about that for a moment. And think about this idea of Mary and Martha. Here's Martha, and she's preparing this awesome meal, but she was cumbered by something. I'll just say this, that sometimes uh, good things, and we all agree that what she was doing was good, right? Sometimes Good things get in the way of the gooderest thing. Just kidding, but the best thing. Sometimes good things get in the way of the best thing. Not the best things, the best thing. Let me tell you what I'm talking about in my own life. I can't tell you what, how you experience this, but let me tell you what I experienced. Just as last week as it pertains to this. And usually when, when I'm getting ready to do something, God takes me to the mat on this text so that I'm ready to get up here and talk to you about it. And so, so here's the thing. Um, <laughs> God said I have to Sabbath. Did you know that God said you have to Sabbath? Yeah. Did you know this? It's one of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. There's, you, you, listen, it, and the Bible also says that, that, that the Sabbath, this day of rest, where you're supposed to stop your normal work. W what do you do for a living? You're a teacher, right? So you, what do you, are you supposed to teach seven days a week? No. You're supposed to, you could do other stuff. But you can't teach that day. What do you do? You serve. You can't serve every single day. There's supposed to be a time when you, you have to rest. And the Bible tells us that, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. So in other words, it's telling us that this day of rest is actually a gift to you. It's, it's, it's so that you could function well for the long haul. You cannot work 24-7. It's a gift to you. Did you know that if you don't keep Sabbath, God is still God? Do you know that no matter what day you pick, whether you're a Sabbath keeper or not, on the, on the Friday night to Saturday, guess what? God is still God. Did you know that? He is. But he said the Sabbath is a gift to you. It also says in the scriptures that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. So here's the problem. Sabbath is tough for me. And when I don't keep a Sabbath, not only am I foregoing the gift that God's trying so desperately to give me so I can make it to the end well, but I'm also calling into question the Lordship of Jesus in my life. Because he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and he said keep it. And if you don't, who's Lord? You might as well point to him yourself. And Sabbath is tough for me. So I'm not gonna hide, about, hide the fact that, that you know, advancing the kingdom of God is like a big deal to me. I'm like super hyped up about that, right? 
I'm super hyped up about that. That's like a big thing. I'm, I'm all about that. So I want to like do stuff to get that done. And, and, and you can ask my wife, like there'll, there'll be times I'm at the house and there's like something that needs to be done here that really has probably no re- redemptive value at all, but I want to like design something or build something or paint something. And I'll, I'm like, she knows I'm like back and forth in my house. I'm like, honey, I'm just so bored. I'm so restless. And it's like midnight and I'm like, I got to go. And I'll get in my car and I'll paint something here because I can't sleep until it's done. Obsessed. You can pray for me. <laughs> it's a big deal for me. <clears throat> and it took my wife this past week to mention something to me about it. She's like, dude, you need to take a Sabbath. Like if we're going to do this for the long haul, you, ne- you need to, to, to rest before you stroke out. I mean, right, it's true. I get fired up. I'm on blood pressure medicine. I, I, will, I, I need that, right? So she reminded me, she's like, no, you need to take Mondays off. No ministry Monday. It's like no shave November. No ministry Monday. I just got that. So, <laughs> so, so I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna try to do that. So, like, so all during the day, I'm like sitting in my chair and I'm like, she walks by and I'm like, I'm resting. I'm resting. This is awesome. <clears throat> but I'm trying. So Monday night comes along. We got our prayer night here. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. <clears throat> so I come in. Starts at 7, right? You guys all know that because you come every week. <clears throat> but... um. But, but it starts at seven, so I come in here, right? And, and, and I, <clears throat> I noticed, I, I remembered that, that the video from the weekend hadn't been uploaded yet onto our YouTube channel. And, and my dear friend, Jonathan Goldstein, you guys, a lot of you know Jonathan, right? He's back there helping out with the kids. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and, and so... He told me, he says, hey, uh, that sermon's going to be online, right? Because we, wa- we want to watch it. He's back there serving right now so you guys can be here. He, didn't get, he doesn't get to sit in here, so he wants to watch the sermon. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So when I got here on Monday, I, I was thinking, okay, I'm going I'm to upload it. Because I'd already converted it to a type of file that will work. And that's all it takes, a few keystrokes on YouTube, and it's boom. So I'm here, and I walk over towards the computer that I use it on, and all of a sudden it's like I could just see my wife, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and she's not in here, so I can make fun of her. And so I just reminded my, uh, she reminded me that, no, it's Sabbath, no keystrokes. I'm like, oh. And I was thinking as I was sitting over here, I, I, I sit on the floor over there during, during our prayer time, and I just kind of hang out over there, me and the Lord, and it's kind of cool. And... Uh, I was thinking, because I'm easily distracted, that the electric bill in this place was due, and I know it needs to be paid by Monday so we don't get a late charge, because I don't want to do that. I want to be responsible, so I make sure that before I leave, I, I make out the check, because tomorrow, as I'm coming back here, I can go right up and pay in Leesburg for the electric bill. And so I stood up, and as I stood up again, the Holy Spirit in the form of a five-foot-tall, dark-haired girl. It's like the shack, right? The, sh- the, 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 the black lady who's God. Don't, if you don't like what I'm saying about God, she's not God, but if you don't like it, send your complaints to Dan Johnson at revolutionchurch.com. So, so she popped up to my mind again. I'm like, no, I can't get the checkbook. I'll just get the checkbook tomorrow, right? Victory. Till I walked into the lobby. We were done. Prayer was done. And I looked on the door, not this door, but the other door over there. And on the door was the little sign that we had put up saying to everyone last week, if anyone shows up on Saturday, we didn't want to like totally diss them because we didn't have Saturday last week. So, so we put up a sign that said, we're not meeting ton- uh, on Saturday night, but we're going to meet everybody at one service Sunday morning, da, 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 right? I saw the sign, so I walked over toward it to go take it down. And as I walked up, guess who pops into my head again? <sighs> It's that woman you gave me. And so I, I went to go, I'm like, no, I can't do that. Listen, Sabbath is tough for me. But, but if I will not obey him in that, 
I'm foregoing my blessing and I'm calling into question the lordship of Jesus in my life. And so I had to say no to that. So, so, so that's why the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 1, to let us strip off every weight that's slowing us down. There's, there's certain good things that are, that are slowing you down and keeping you from the gooderest thing, the best thing. There's certain things. And you can have your own list of those things. I don't know what they are in your life. But, but for Martha, it was this dinner. She was serving the Lord and serving the Lord well, right? But that was a distraction. That was the thing that she was dragging around with her. And she's carrying it with her no matter where she goes. She's got this thing in her mind that says, when Jesus is around, this is what I'm supposed to do. But that's not the thing that God wanted her to do. What God wanted her to do was get to his feet and listen. That's what he wanted. That's what he wants. That's priority one in the life of a Christian, is to be at Jesus' feet. And so... Let's get down to the brass tacks of what this means for Revolution Church as a whole. What, what do Mary and Martha have to do with this church right here? Well, again, Martha is preparing a meal for Jesus. That's a good thing, right? Would you all agree? That's good. Anything that you would do for the Lord, is it good? Come on, right? You're doing it for God. And even if everyone thinks it's stupid, like let's just say you were building a huge boat for the flood, for rain that had never come before. Who would do something stupid like that? Noah. But was it awesome? Yeah, it was awesome. He did it for the Lord, so that was good. Martha's dinner was good. I wonder if it was any good. I don't know. I grew up in a kosher home. My mom, whew, she used to, listen, can I just get, come on now. She used to, anyone else kosher in this room? No one's kosher, right? She used to put salt on the steak. Sucks out all the, the juicy flavor. I don't want to be Jewish. Who would do something like that? That's not good. That's not good worship. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> So Martha's preparing a dinner for, for Jesus, and it is good, but Mary is sitting at his feet, and she's listening to what Jesus has to say. Jesus says, this singular thing is the most important thing. That's all you should be concerned with, is being at my feet. And let me just clarify here for a second. When I talk about grading on the, court, on, on the, on the curve and, and all that, by no means is Jesus saying that depending on what you do, on how you choose to worship God, does that alter or change how much God loves you? No. It has nothing to do with that. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. That means while you were a sinner, while you weren't worshiping him at all, he loved you at 100%. So much that he gave his son to save you. And that love doesn't change what, no matter what you do. What, and when, when you become a Christian, he doesn't love you more that day. He might be fired up and excited about it, no doubt, but he doesn't love you more. And if you cook a meal for him instead of sitting at the Bible study, that doesn't mean the person at the Bible study is loved more by God than the person who's serving the meal. This is talking about how he wants to be worshipped, not how he wants to be loved or how he loves you. I gotta tell you this honestly, that spending time in the presence of God at his feet and letting him speak into your life is the pinnacle of human existence. There's nothing more important than that. And when, you, when that starts to, to, to bombard your brain and you start thinking about what I just told you, that's gonna change your perspective on everything. That's gonna change your day planner, man. It ought to. Being at his feet and letting him speak to you, should, it's the most important thing you could do with your entire life. Today or any day. Nothing's more important. You listen, Moses' face when he came down off Mount Sinai wasn't glowing because he had a good meal. It wasn't glowing because the gators won. 
It was glowing because he stood in the presence of God and God spoke into his life. And that's why his face was glowing. It's the most important thing that you can do with your 24 hours every single day is to be in the presence of God and let him speak to you. Psalm 27, 4 says this. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek. Do you see how important this is? Whatever's coming up right now, it's important, right? It must be important. It's the only thing that this person would ask of God. If I asked you, what would you ask of God right now? Does anyone have a, a, a top five list? And maybe it would be someone who's sick. Anyone? Raise your hand. Is, 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 it some, is it a relationship maybe that you're in or you know of that needs healing? Is it a financial thing? Is it for our country? What, I don't know what it is, but this guy's saying, of all the things I could ask, there's one thing and one thing alone that I would ask of you, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. That's the most important thing. It's not the most important thing to most of us. <clears throat> you guys heard of the Apostle Paul. He wrote much of the New Testament. He was the guy who was killing Christians and on the road to go do that more, on his quest to go end the church of Jesus Christ, Jesus appears to him and knocks him down on the ground and saves him, the Christian murderer. He saves him and begins to pour into Paul's life, so much so that he actually wrote most, most of the New Testament. That's awesome. But yet... In Philippians 3.10, Paul, who knew Jesus so well, right? He knows him well. Would you say that he knows him well? Yeah. Super Christian. Greatest Christian. Like ultimate Christ follower. The Apostle Paul. And he says in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ. What's up with that? How does this guy who knows Christ closer than anyone, like he didn't hear it in a book. He didn't hear it from a preacher. Jesus Christ came down and talked to him. But yet, he says, that's not enough. I want to know him more. I want to know him more. I want to know Christ and experience the power that raised him from the dead. I want to know him in an intimate, passionate, close way, powerful way. I want to know him. Most of the time, the word know in the New Testament is translated love. He wants to fall in love. What happens when you fall in love with someone? I remember when I was falling head over heels for my wife. I remember working up at the dealership and I started dating Meredith and man, I definitely married up. I don't care what you guys think, I'm gonna say it. She is hot and I is way, way past my league and I know it. And I remember I started dating her and I was, I was a typical stupid man. And I walk around the dealership and I was just telling those guys, wait till you see what walks in that front door, dude. I was so excited about her. I couldn't stand it. She, she was beautiful and she loved the Lord. And, and it was, I was so excited about it. I wanted to know her more and more. I want to spend more time with her. I was totally enamored. And, and Paul was like that about Jesus. He didn't just meet him once on that, that day where he knocked him down and, and, and saved him and put him on mission. And he's like, no, I want to know Christ more. And because of Paul's insatiable desire to know Jesus more and more and more on, an, on, a, on, a, on a deeper level all the time, what happened to Paul is he became a gospel-preaching, church-planting freak. He couldn't stop. He was so enamored, so in love, so in awe of God. He wanted to know him more and more and more. Speak to me, Lord. Spend time in, in his presence. And the more he did, the more he couldn't stop telling people about it. It says in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, I'm compelled to preach. He says this. He goes, woe to me if I do not preach the good news. He's like, I, 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 listen, I cannot even, I've been in the presence of God. 
I've been hanging out with the Lord. He's been speaking to me. He's been loving on me. He's been correcting me. And you know what? As a result of that, I have to tell you guys about him. It was the same thing with my wife. You fall in love, you got to go tell people about it. And Paul was totally head over heels in love with Jesus Christ the Lord. And because of that, he's like, I cannot not preach. I have to preach. Don't try to stop me. Woe to, he knew, he understood that it was more than just love too. He graduated past the, just the love and he understood his responsibility to the Lord. Because of what God had done for him, he understood that he had a responsibility. Woe to me if I don't preach. I have to tell people about the Lord. That's why he saved me, to go do this. And he said he, he was given the privilege of sharing the good news. That was his ministry. And so, when people come to me person after person and ask me about this church, you know, where are you at and what are you all about? Here's, the, here's a big one. What's next for revolution? Everyone wants to know what's next. What's the next big program? You know, a couple weeks ago, they, the, the newspaper came in and did an article uh, about our church. And, 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 and she's like, all right, so it's revolution. You guys know what revolution means? It's a, it's a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. And so I, I, I could just sense that every time someone talks to me, they, they love the name of the church, and it's got this, you know, this war cry feel to it. It's, it's something different. What's so different? And they're anticipating this awesome answer. You're going to give them some, like, oh, moment that's going to be incredible that nobody experienced before. It's, we've got it figured out. Only here. And, and I'm telling them, like, what our revolution is. And we've got some vocabulary for it around here. And it's called vertical. It's vertical. See, if, if you think about what Paul was telling us here, what was his pursuit? Was his pursuit to serve the Lord? Or was that the result of the pursuit? See, he, his desire was to know the Lord. And as a result of knowing him more and more and more, he couldn't stop preaching and planting churches. And so it's this, all of us. And, and so what's our task here? I, my, my task and the leadership of this church, what we do every single time we're together is to help you with this. See, if we get this, listen, this is an awesome spot right here. You listen up. If we get this, all of this gets taken care of. Amen. You, you, listen, you don't, uh, Jesus, people that are Jesus freaks don't need to be begged to come, to come serve. And, and Jesus freaks don't need to be begged to go feed the homeless. And Jesus freaks don't need to, get, to be begged to give money to Christian organizations that are bringing God's word to the ends of the earth and translating the Bible. Like, we don't have to be begged. We can't help it. It's what we do. When you fall, you can clap. When, when, when you fall in love here, when you get this, you get this. But let me tell you something. If you're just pursuing, pursuing stuff and programs and reaching people, that's awesome if you want to reach people. Who are you reaching them for? See, we can do this and we get this. But if we go after this as our main push, the people that are pursuing people and advancing this kingdom they might never know Jesus. And that's a scary thought. <clears throat> you guys ever hear of Willow Creek Community Church? Anyone? Willow Creek is in uh, Barrington, Illinois. It's just outside of Chicago. And it's one of the largest churches in the country. They have, I don't know, 20, 25,000 people that attend. During their 20-year anniversary service this past year, they had to rent a stadium because they couldn't fit the people in their 7,500-seat auditorium. They had nine Christmas Eve services at Willow Creek last year. Now, I'm not smart, but nine times 7,500, what's that? A lot, <laughs> right? A lot of people. 
And, and they've got churches all over the world that are part of their association and fellowship, and they're helping plant them. And, 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 they've, and we went there. We, when some of us in our team, we went up to Chicago this past year, and we went to a conference at another church, but we went to go visit Willow Creek because it's so massive. It's like driving up to a mall, and we get up there, and, and, and they're just so filled with all these different these programs and, and initiatives, and they're meeting people's needs, and they're serving the community, and they don't have to worry about volunteers for serving. There's so many people. I have a buddy that's at a church in, uh, in Longwood, a huge church over there. He's discouraged because when he wants to volunteer, they don't even need him. I really can't wait for that day. <laughs> Just going on the record, right? Just saying it right there. So, so, so you, we, we walk in, we're like, wow. This is a, they have a bowling alley in here. Wow, awesome. You can save people that are bowling. <clears throat> so they did a study on their own, critiquing their own ministry. And this is what Bill Hybels, the senior pastor who founded it over 20 years ago, he said this. We made a mistake. What we should have done when people crossed the line of faith and became Christians we should have started telling people and teaching people that they have to take responsibility to become self-feeders. We should have gotten people and then taught people how to read their Bible between service, how to do the spiritual practices much more aggressively on their own. In other words, spiritual growth doesn't happen best by becoming dependent on elaborate church programs but through the age-old spiritual practices of prayer, Bible reading, and relationships. And ironically, these basic disciplines do not require multi-million dollar facilities and hundreds of staff to manage them. And he finishes the letter by writing one word, joy. Can you imagine that? We made a mistake. One of the biggest churches in all the world we made a mistake. We were here. And our focus was on felt needs and social injustice and helping people out and what do people want and getting people to serve. And let's focus on evangelism. Let's focus on outreach. And those things are all good. We should do them. But it's not the best thing. It's not the best thing. Mary displays what's best. <clears throat> Mary displays what's best in two ways. First and foremost, she's at his feet. This is positional worship. Do you understand what I mean by this? Yes. That, means, that means I am low and you are high and lifted up. I'm here. I'm at your feet. The posture of my body is reflecting the posture of my heart. What I think and what everyone else thinks, that's not the most important thing. It's what you think. The position of my body indicated the position of her heart. It was positional worship. She was also listening to him. This is volitional worship. This is a conscious choice of my will. I choose this. All other things even if they're important, are second compared to what Jesus Christ is saying right now. I'm in position to receive and worshiping him this way. I'm also volitional worship. I choose this. Do you, know, do you want to know what that looks like here in today's context in our church? Would you guys like to see that? Here, hold on a second. Let's do this. <clears throat> could you, um, Dana, could you come here please? You're going to play Jesus. That's real easy, right? Yeah. Just be awesome and perfect. <laughs> well, well, there's grace. This is a grace church. Go ahead, man. Yeah. <clears throat> Wrath. Just kidding. Totally kidding. Totally kidding. Totally kidding. Okay. So, so if, 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 if I think I said that you were God earlier, so this is worse. This is so worse. I don't know that Jesus looked anything like that either. <clears throat> but we're just going to pretend that he's Jesus. I'm going to just play me. I'm okay at that. And um, I need some help. Um, anybody over here have my number in their phone? Do you? Well, uh, Tim, you got my number? 
Can you do a quick, can you call me? Yeah, no chance of that happening. Um, Grayson, could you, <laughs> yeah. You have my number there, Grayson? Yeah, do me, do me a favor and, and why don't you just go ahead and call me. Can, and I'm just going to play, I'm going to play. So now, when you call me, let's just pretend that this is, um, this is uh, Saturday night, Saturday evening, um, and here's some great news. It's, it's Saturday evening at like five o'clock, and, and you know that I don't have a whole lot of cash, right? So you've got tickets to go to, uh, this, to, to Disney, and, and we get to take the kids to Disney, and you're going to bless me with that, and, and, and that would be awesome because you want to you wanna bless me with that, right? So here, go ahead and just call me, call me with that, and, and go ahead and just do that, and I'm going to be here, and I'm going to be at Jesus' feet, and I'm going to just be listening, and... Uh, Hold on a second here. Um, message. Um, what did I send you? Did you get that? Sorry, I can't talk right now. Anybody over here have my number? Someone call me. And and but but this is a little bit different. This is this is um. Yeah, I don't know who that is. Oh, <clears throat> this phone call here, this is, um, this is on Wednesday evening, because on Wednesday evening we have a, a study here, and you want to call me, and, and you want to, you want to, um, you want to come in, and you want to, you want to serve, right? You want to help, and, and you want to take pictures for the church, and put them on the website, and that's very kind of you, and so you're calling me, but, but on Wednesday night at, at, at you know, at, 6.30, we have the Bible study. And so, um, could you call me now? That would be great if you could offer that blessing to me. Um, uh, sorry, I can't talk right now. Because I'm at Jesus' feet. Um, could somebody else, anybody else have my phone number? Yeah, could you call me, but it's Monday night now. We're, we're role playing. And, and it's Monday night, and, and, and prayer starts at 7. And so you've called because um, you guys need help because your refrigerator was out or your washer machine was dead, and someone's going to give you one, and you need our help to, to move it. Would that be a good thing? Yeah. Okay, but I'm at Jesus' feet. Oh. Sorry. I can't talk right now. Am I making, uh, I don't know who that is, but <laughs> sorry. You guys can quit kidding around now, right? <clears throat> Thanks, Jesus. I want to stand over there before I say that. Jesus. Yeah, so, so did, did, did you guys, am I making my point, like is it crystal clear what I'm trying to tell you? I, I hope, I don't know if you're, liking what I'm saying, but I, I certainly hope that you're understanding what I'm saying. <clears throat> you know, our, our prayer night on Mondays, um, it's from 7 to 8 o'clock at night. And so <clears throat> we come in on, on Monday nights and the lights are dim and there's some quiet music playing just in the background. Sometimes it's just like a piano and sometimes it's worship music. We come in and, and you find a spot. Let's look up here. You find a spot and it's vertical. You don't, I don't have to pray with you and you don't have to pray with me and I don't, you don't have to get up and say a prayer and I'm not gonna tell you how to pray. And No, you come in and you sit and you spend an hour with your church family praying. I'm going to steal something that Robert shared with us this past Wednesday night, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. I think, you tell me if you agree, I think there's a direct correlation between the amount that God will bless this church. I think it's directly tied to the commitment of this church to come together and plead with him to do things. Anyone? I think that God has blessed this church in crazy ways. You're sitting in it. 
But I can't help but think how much more he would do. Maybe tonight, maybe it wouldn't be two baptisms. I'm just throwing it out there. Maybe it wouldn't be two baptisms. Maybe it'd be five. Maybe, maybe it'd be two baptisms tonight and then tomorrow morning when we meet back here at 10, there's another baptism or two. And then next weekend, I, I'm just saying that maybe we could come to expect crazy blessings from God that maybe he's just up there in heaven and he's got his hands filled with blessing and he's waiting to dump it upon our church if his people would just come together and pray. I'm just wondering what God would do if we were serious about building his church with him and coming in together every Monday night and, and just pleading with the Lord, do something. I've got a marriage that's a problem. I've got a kid that's a problem. I've got a company that's a problem. I've got a nation that's at, almost at war. I, I, Lord, I want our church to grow. I want the kids in every high school to know you and love you and not end up in jail, but end up in the worship team. That's what I want so bad, Lord. You guys want that? Why not ask him? Why not get together and ask him? Is it not important? This is the brass tacks. I'm not being nice. I'm just telling you the truth. Is it not important enough to do? You've carved out this time on Saturday night. Would you not carve out an hour on Monday night to sit with your church family and plead with the Lord to save your city? Would you not? On Wednesday night, we get together. We're doing this vertical study right now. We're, 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 we're getting rid of all this horizontal thinking about taking care of all this and what do people want in a church? Who cares what people want in a church? It's not your church, it's his. What does God want in his church? How does he want us to do stuff? What does he want us to do? What does he want us to be about? What do we do when we gather? And we've been learning that through this study and it's been awesome. It's awesome Bible instruction, awesome Bible explanation, and tremendous, powerful Bible application. What would God do here in this church if his people would commit to doing this? To giving it 6.30 to 8 on Wednesday night to come and sit at Jesus' feet and learn. No more check mark. I did my weekend. I'm done. I'm talking about engaging in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 where the church is described how it's supposed to be. It's, it's, pre it's prescriptive. It's not descriptive of some awesome thing that they did. They all gathered every day and they worshiped the Lord and the church exploded. Tell me he wouldn't do the same now. Come on. Someone has to get fired up in here. Right? Come on. That's what God wants to do. The windows of heaven are bursting with blessing if we would just ask, but we don't. And that's why it doesn't happen the way it should. <clears throat> so if faith comes from hearing the word of God, right? That's what the Bible says. Faith comes from hearing. And Jesus is telling the ladies there at the house, listen, listen, what Mary's doing, listening to what I'm saying, this is the most important thing. Because he's trying to build her faith. He wasn't trying to get Martha to not serve. That was not his intention. He was just telling them the most important thing is, is your faith will grow and greater service will be had if you will sit at my feet and listen. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. So let me ask you this, bluntly, in your face, how many times a week are you putting yourself in faith-building environments, where the word of God is proclaimed over you, where the word of God is read personally, and where God's voice can be heard in prayer. How many times a week are you doing this? 2 Timothy 3.17 says it is God's word that prepares all his people to do the work of the ministry. Are we pursuing the work of the ministry or are we pursuing the Lord? who would empower us and tell us how to do the work of the ministry. See, there's an order to the kingdom of God. First, you must listen for an extended period of time often. 
Sit at his feet and listen to the Lord. Let him pour into you life so you know what to do and you have the power to do so effectively. Are you doing that? How's that going? What we do here at the church is just the tip of the iceberg of opportunities to help you in that. But are you taking advantage of that? It, that should be your jump off point. Remember what Heibel said, self-feeding. You should come and listen to this lunatic yell at you. You should come on Wednesday night and have Robert talk to you. And you should come on Monday nights. You should do those things. But that's just supplemental to what should be going on in your own life all the time. How can we possibly impact our world if we haven't been empowered by God by sitting at his feet? And it breaks my heart to come in here. This is not a rip. This is loving. And I'm trying to bring some conviction to you. How many times I walk into the room on a Wednesday or a Monday and see so... Listen, I know that there's exceptions. I understand that you can't because of something. I get it. Well, I'm talking to the people who could come but choose not to. And you know who you are. I'm not ripping you. I'm just saying it would be better for you if you did. Yeah. I'm saying it would be better for your church if you did. Yeah. I'm just saying it would be better for the kingdom of God in the city of Leesburg and the Golden Triangle if you did. Yeah. Why not do it? Why not pack this? I mean, I can't, um, can you imagine what God would do if people would get on their knees and pray? Oh, my Lord. Every great revival through the ages started with people praying their guts out and pleading with the Lord, please, Lord, do something that we cannot. Yeah. That's how it starts. Yeah. That's where it needs to stay. Yeah. Listen, I can't speak of your commitment to those things, but I have a commitment I will lay before you right now. It's the same, nothing's changed. For those of you who've known me for a number of years, you know I don't change much. I'm gonna pray a lot. I'm going to study God's word a lot. And, and every single week, as long as the Lord would give me breath and strength, I will stand up here and I will deliver a message from God's word, cover to cover, with no apology, and give you messages that stretch you and challenge you and drive you to the Bible to look for answers and drive you to your knees to repent and drive you to your feet and out of your seat to praise him. That's what we need to do. And I'm just asking you if you'll partner with me and, and, and be here and do this thing together. If you hear it and you don't do it, you're fooling yourself. You're not a Christian. Yeah. That's the hard line, but that's what the Bible says. Yeah. I didn't write it. It says if, you're, if you don't do what you're told, you're fooling yourself. That's what we're going to do every weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And then we're going to provide biblical faith building and stretching teaching every single Wednesday night to challenge you to greater levels of faith, to challenge you to greater levels of trust, to challenge you to greater levels of generosity and service. But it comes from sitting at Jesus' feet. I could get up here with a sign-up sheet right now and I could guilt many of you into serving with those kids right now. I guarantee it. I'm Jewish, that's what we do. And I'm really good at it. How long till you hate what you're doing back there? A week? Yeah. <laughs> Truth in church, amen. amen. I could get you to do it. I could twist your arm, put you in a chicken wing and make you do it. That's just not gonna do any good. But listen, you know what's awesome? When you come and you sit at Jesus' feet. And over time, he starts to speak to you. And inside of you swells up this great desire to see kids come to the Lord. And you say, preacher, sign me up. You come to me, you'll be there for a while, and it'll be profitable. I come to you, it's not going to last, and you're going to hate me. It's true. Come on, right? You've all done it. That's not what we need to do. I want to help you fall in love with Jesus. I want you to sit at his feet. And so the momentous shift in the status quo is nothing fancy. It's the coach saying, get back to the basics, man. Your swing's off. Your stance is no good. Your grip is no good. Let's get back to the basics. 
So getting back to the basics for us, this momentous shift in the status quo is taking the horizontal perspective of the local church aimed at programs and events to attend and to serve at and, and just be like Paul. Help you get to know Christ. That's it. If, we, if we're a room filled with people who know the Lord intimately, passionately pursuing him, what would happen to this city? Can you see it? Can you see the white tents going up? I can see them. Are you with me? Come on. I can see it. I can see it. You got to see it. You got to see it before it's going to happen. You got to see it. Do you see the people coming to the cross? Do you see the people coming to the altar? Do you see the, the stuff on TV that we go, man, look, how does Billy Graham do that? He wants to do it right here. God wants to do the same here as he did at a crusade in Los Angeles. He, because he doesn't get more glory by doing it through Billy Graham than he does doing it through you or you. God gets the glory. He wants his kingdom to build. So, so can you see it? Can you see it here? Let's stop being, don't look at the TV and look at the big church and go, oh, well, they could do it because they're in L.A. And they could do it because they're in Chicago. And they could do it because they're in Miami and New York City. Why not have big church mentality in the small town? It, because we can't limit God on the population and what he'll do on the population of the city we're in. His, his word says that he's the one who, who appoints when the nations will rise and fall in their boundaries. He decides the population of every city. So how can we, how can we cap God's progress based on the population? No, the population is based on God. He wants to build his church right here like crazy, and he's waiting for us to partner with him. He's not, he's not weak in any way. He's not deficient in some way. He does, he's not weak at all. He doesn't have not enough money in his checkbook or not enough time on his schedule to get this thing done. He's waiting on y'all. You're too busy. This is what he wants to do. Can you see it? I can see it. That's what drives me up here every single week because I can see it, and I know it's coming. I know it's coming, and I know I'm not the only one in this room that, that senses it. It's bubbling. We want to help you to know the Lord. <clears throat> now, when we first got started, I mentioned to you that there was like another issue that this brought up. And uh, I'll touch briefly on it before we wrap up. <clears throat> but it's actually very similar to what we've just been dissecting for like the last 40 minutes. The same thing, it's the same house. In, in, in Luke, it doesn't tell us where that is. It's in Bethany. The Gospel of John describes this other story in the same house with many of the same people. I would say Martha's there, Mary's there, Jesus and his disciples are there. But then in John chapter 11, this dude Lazarus is there. Okay? You don't have to turn there if you don't want, but I would recommend you read the story for sure. But in a nutshell, here's the story. Um, Jesus is going along doing his God thing, going town to town, preaching and praying and, and healing people and multiplying food. And he's just an awesome, awesome leader. And he's tireless and he's going out to saving people. It's just amazing, right? The, 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 de the, the, the blind are seeing and, and, and the people who can't speak are speaking and the ones who can't hear are hearing and the lepers are being healed. And it's just an incredible ministry, town to town. He's preaching the word of God. And, and, and they come to this one place, and all of a sudden some messengers come and say, hey, um, you know your buddy Lazarus, you know, uh, Mary and Martha and then Lazarus, you know, you, I know you love them. Um, your buddy Lazarus is like super, super sick. Like super sick, like not a cold, like he's going to die. If you don't come, healer, he's going to die. And, and the Bible is so awesome, it just goes on. I love the, the gritty truth of God's word. Um, let me ask you this first. If, if someone you know has like this big pressing need and you could help them with that, should you go do it? Yes. Yeah. If it's really pressing and like, let's say that like if you didn't do it, they were going to die. Should you do it like right then and there? Stop what you're doing? Yeah. He didn't. Good job. <clears throat> yeah. What's wrong with Jesus? 
He must be part of the wrong denomination. He doesn't get it. Christians are supposed to go. Jump when I tell you to jump. I got something wrong with me. Help me right now. Go, jump. Right? Not Jesus. Why didn't Jesus do that? Hmm. So we already talked about the greater good. What we're talking about here is the greater glory. The greater glory. Verse 4 says why this is happening. Why is this guy sick? Why is he on the verge of death? And why am I not going to see him when, yeah, he's sick. I could heal him. Yeah, their cars, your cars broke down the side of the road. I could go help you, but I'm not. Now, if I, if, if, Candy, if you called me and said, oh, my car's broke down the side of the road, could you come help me? And I said, no. Would that be a very good friend? Probably not. That wouldn't be very nice, right? Dana, I'm bleeding over here, man. I'm bleeding. Can you help me? He said no. What kind of friend are you? Well, that's what Jesus did. He says in verse 4 he, that this was happening for God's glory. <clears throat> it's for his glory is God's power displayed. Uh, his fame increased, his kingdom advancing. This is God's glory. And this is why it's happening. This good dude's going to die. So, so maybe I should go help right away. No, I love him and I could heal him, but uh, I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> A lot of you guys are probably like Mary and Martha and maybe even Lazarus waiting for You've been praying for something for a long time and something's on your horizon that's just really crushing you and, it's, and you're waiting for a breakthrough. Anybody? Yeah. <clears throat> People are waiting for a breakthrough. They need something to happen. Move God! Move God! Right, we're praying. Please. Nothing yet. You think Mary and, you think Mary and Martha were, were, were looking for a breakthrough? Their brother was about to die. See, they were looking for a breakthrough? Let me ask you this. You think Lazarus was looking for a breakthrough? I'm going to die. Listen, let me tell you something. Can you bring up the next slide? I need you to repeat this with me right now. Let's hear it. It's not over till Jesus says it's over. Do you understand? See, you see, we, 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 we want to we wanna impose these things on God. Like, we don't want to come in and, and really pray and seek his will. We want to come in and say, Lord, you're good and you're awesome and powerful because I have this problem and if you'll fix it this way and in this time, then you're awesome. And Jesus is like, whatever, dude. You ain't God and I am. And so he stopped what he was doing, right? And said, listen, guys, I'm not going. What? Because it was for God's glory. Sometimes... The, the thing that you need done and the way you want it done and how you want it done is not going to bring God the most glory. He didn't want to heal a sick guy. He wanted to raise a dead guy. Because that, that gives God more glory. Right? That's odd. Like if, if, if one of you guys was sick and I went out there and I prayed for you and you got healed, awesome, right? God is good. You'd, you'd probably tell people about that. You'd probably be on Facebook tonight. And, and, and rightfully so, that'd be great. We could, we could tell everyone how God is so great. But what if someone died right here, right now? And we all got around that person, and in Jesus' name we prayed, and that person woke up. Ooh. Boom! Where do you think, what would happen then? God's glory. Yes. God's glory. And that's what he wants. That's what he wants. Why did he do it this way? Why didn't he do it the way Mary and Martha wanted him to do it? Why didn't he do it the way you and I would want him to do it? Let's be honest, right? We'd want him to go heal the sick guy. Why? Well, he gave the answer why. It's in verse 15. So you will really believe. That's why. You doubters. If I heal the sick guy, others have done that in my name, but they've done that. I'm raising a dead guy. That's why. So you will really believe. That's why. Why don't you close your Bibles and your notebooks and all that stuff. And I want to pray for you.
I want to pray for you. And then we're going to, listen, then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have two people get baptized right here, right now. Awesome. Awesome. You guys ready? Yeah. yeah. I'm excited. I got to take off my watch so it doesn't get wet. And then listen, after they get baptized, it's going to be your opportunity to worship God. The band's going to come up and they're going to sing. They're going to give you the opportunity to sing to him. Anybody in here feel like God spoke to him tonight at all? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, an ovation is really cool and I know it makes him happy, but you know what he really wants? He wants your worship. He wants you to, at the top of your lungs, with, listen, love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Your mind, your heart should be pouring out all your strength. You should be singing at the top of your lungs. Listen, the greatest church service I ever went to, 3,000 people, right? We could barely hear the band because the people sang. And when that band hit that first note, there was 3,000 people, 6,000 hands straight to heaven and every voice at the top of their lungs. I was like, ah, woo! I didn't want to leave. That's what he's looking for. Amen. That's what he's looking for. Let's pray and then we're gonna, then Tyler and Jolene are gonna be baptized. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. I thank you, Lord, that you are completely, completely aware of everyone in this room, you see their heart. You know the struggles they have. You know the breakthrough that they need. You know the pain in their life. You are looking and you are waiting. You are waiting to hear from us. And you are waiting to pour out your blessing upon every single need in your church if we would gather and ask. Your word tells us that if us sinful dads know how to give good gifts, how much more would our heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? And so, Lord, I pray right now, unashamed, that you would help us all right now, as we sit here, to understand the importance and the blessing and the privilege and the opportunity that you have presented to us to gather here on the other evenings of the week, on Monday nights, that you would you'd provide a place here where you could come and speak to your people, where your people could come and speak to you, and that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing upon your church if we would gather and pray. Your word says that the eyes of the Lord go back and forth across the earth, searching and wanting to, to, to bless those whose hearts are completely his. And so, Lord, we, I pray that you'd help our church be that type of people, a type of people whose hearts are completely yours, that we desire the things of the kingdom above the desires of anything else, that the priority of ministry is the most important thing that a human being can do. And for us to be effective in that, Lord, for us to be effective in any single thing that we do for you, we must first spend time with you. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, I pray, with our schedules. Help us to realize in our heart the importance of gathering and worshiping and praying Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for, for a man like Robert who comes every single week faithfully prepared to give to the people your word, to equip them to do every good work. Thank you, Lord, for the band. What an amazing team of musicians and vocalists who come week in and week out to faithfully serve you. I thank you for them, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'd help them to find time in their schedule, their busy schedule, to spend time at your feet. Build into us, Lord, all that we need that we might be effective for you. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity right now to 
participate in the obedience to God's word displayed by our brother and sister in Christ. Lord, it never gets tiresome to do this. It never gets old. Say hello to Tyler, everybody. It's not cold at all, brother. I warmed it up for you. Spoiled. Oh, yeah, huh? Can we pray for Tyler? You guys remember the day you got baptized? Awesome, right? I still remember it like it was yesterday. It was an amazing time. Now, how many years separate today from the day I got baptized? I'm thinking about it right now in my mind. Awesome. Awesome. You know what's really awesome is that today he gets to enjoy this with you. And he'll never forget you. I want to ask you that you would never forget him. So we're going to pray for him right now, but I pray, I ask that you would continue as the Lord would prick your heart to do so, to pray for him as he leads his family. Amen? Let's start, let's start that process right now. Lord, I thank you for Tyler. I thank you for my dear new friend. Uh, he's sort of invaded my life in a, in a bigger way than most people do, and I, I thank you for that. He's, he's just my kind of dude, man, and, and I love him. And, and I love his obedience to your word. I love the fact that he's real. I love the fact that he's admitted his shortcomings and his, and his desire to want to do better. Now the Bible says that we fail in many ways and he knows that to be the case. And he's done his failing. It was a long time ago, I guess, that he was in a tank once before and he said, Lord, you're my savior, but his life has indicated that you were not always his Lord. But your Bible does tell us that you have been made, Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior. And he has not always done that. But his request to the church is ultimately his request to you. To help him and accept him as he is looking beyond his past mistakes and looking on to a bright future with a desire to be a new person and to follow the Lordship of Jesus in his life. And I thank you for that, Lord. Your word tells us that by no means, Lord Jesus, would you turn away anyone who comes to you? And so we know right now your arms are wide open for Tyler. We thank you, Lord. We ask that you would bless him and help him to lead his wife and lead his family, lead his employees at work, lead his community, to be a bold man of God, a healthy and powerful witness to the power that raised you from the dead. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. Do you have anything you'd like to say? No. Nothing at all? <laughs> all right. Just glad to do this again. All right. Glad to do it. This is awkward. It's all right. It shouldn't be awkward. Only everyone's looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler, very, very simple. Who is your number one, only, forever, Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Based on that confession, I now bury you with Christ. And like him, you'll be raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. Tyler, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. So don't go anywhere. <laughs> the Bible is clear when it talks about disciple making and baptizing it never ever says okay pastors go baptize people did you know that <clears throat> Jesus great commission to all of you if you're a disciple of Christ is for you to do what I'm doing and my job is to equip you to do God's work and I've just done that so Jolene please come up as your husband baptizes you <clears throat> I'm going to let you do the honors. I'll pray with you. Yeah. You're a disciple of Jesus. I want you to get used to this. Do you want me to do the praying or you want to do the praying? I'll pray. 
I'll do the pray and you do the Duncan. All right. Don't hold her down long. Okay. I promise. All right. Well, let's pray for Jolene. Lord, I thank you uh, not only for, uh, for Tyler, but also for his precious wife whom he loves. Your word tells us that if we have found a wife, we have found a treasure and found favor with the Lord. And he has found that treasure in his wife. You know, Lord, the world is, is, is competing with, with you to try to rip marriages apart. But your word tells us in the book of Colossians that in you, Lord Jesus, all things are held together. And so what, what, God, what you have done, what you have brought together, let no man separate. And all the, although the enemy in the world system that's, that he watches over has tried dearly to rip this couple apart, you have held them together. And today they celebrate a new beginning, a new start as new people in a new church serving this new Jesus that is now Lord not just Savior, but Lord. Lord, I pray for her. I pray that she would be an awesome, awesome woman of God, boldly proclaiming the grace of God to whomever she comes in contact with. Lord, I pray for her to, to make it easy for her to submit to her husband in all things as unto the Lord, for them to honor each other in marriage. And Lord, I pray for their marriage, that their marriage would reflect how beautiful you are, Lord Jesus. When they see this couple, let them see you. That's what our prayer is. Help her also to lead the family in a Christ-centered, gospel-believing, gospel-preaching, compassionate, loving way. All that you would want for them, Lord, bless their home. Bless their home, Lord. Open up the windows of heaven and pour down your blessing on this family. Let them be mighty for your kingdom. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you have a seat? That water's 80 degrees. That's what nerves look like. Love you. Come on now. Who's your Lord and Savior? Based on the confession, your husband baptizes you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. Can we come to our feet and give God an ovation that he deserves? God is at work. He's building his church, and he inhabits the praises of his people. So let's praise him now with these songs, okay? Let's praise him.